Hello, my name is Will DeGravio, and welcome to episode four of the Video Essay Podcast, a show featuring conversations with leading critics, scholars, filmmakers, and other creators about the craft of videographic criticism. On today's show, I sit down with Grace Lee, who many of you may know from her popular YouTube channel, What's So Great About That? In our conversation, Grace and I talk about her background, why she began making video essays. We also talk about what it's like being a video essayist on YouTube and how to please the YouTube algorithm. And we dive in deep to her video essay, Feathered Foes, Birds in Horror. We also have an extended conversation about the video essay, Reading, Binging, Benning, a desktop documentary by Kevin B. Lee and Chloe galbert Linnae. Before we get to my conversation with Grace, I'd like to first act as a kind of newscaster. As I mentioned before, I want this opening portion of the show to include news and notes from the World of Video Essays, upcoming publications. If you're soliciting video essays for film festivals or a publication or perhaps just a conference in the near future, I want to know about it and I want to be able to share it with our listeners. So please go to thevideoessay.com slash connect and fill out a form and let me know what's going on. Or if it's easier, shoot me an email with some information. I really want this show to be a resource for folks who are interested in watching and learning more about video essays. So please let me know and fill out the form. The first piece of news is that the academic journal In Transition will be releasing a new issue at the end of this week. For those unfamiliar, In Transition is the first academic journal of videographic criticism. You can access the new issue by going to mediacommons.org slash in transition. The second piece of information is that on October 12th at the Birkbeck Institute of the Moving Image in London will be a free event titled Repetition and Variation video essays as comparative film and TV studies methodologies. This event will be a screening and symposium on videographic criticism and will feature the work of several leading video essayists who will be there in person. I will actually be moving to the United Kingdom on October 1st to begin graduate school, so I'm going to come down and attend the event. So if you're there, please be on the lookout. I'd love to meet as many listeners as possible. And you can find more information on the event at our website, thevideoessay.com. Finally, I'd like to introduce our extra credit segment. Last week, I asked our Twitter followers to share with me video essays that they've published in the last few months. And what I've done is I've rounded up all of those tweets into a single Twitter thread, and I've shared it on our website and on Twitter, and I'm calling this segment, as I've said, extra credit. So there's additional viewing that you all can watch to support the work of your fellow video essayists. I'd like to give a special shout out to Adrian Martin and Christina Alvarez Lopez's video essay series, Thinking Machine in Film Crant. When I posted asking for updates from the world of video essays, Adrian commented and remarked that he read recently that the most notable video essayists were operating in the United States and that the few who are operating outside of the United States seem to only be academics. So I'd like to share this series to correct the record on that and say that there are, in fact, notable examples being produced outside of the U.S. by non-academics. And now, here's our interview with Grace Lee. Oh, yesterday evening I saw a man standing alone, broken and sick, broken and sick. Grace, welcome to the Video Essay Podcast. Thank you so much for being on the show. How are you doing today? Thank you for having me on the show. I'm doing good. My first question is a fairly straightforward one, and that is, can you please tell us a little bit about yourself? I think because you are probably primarily known as what's so great about that and not Grace Lee, that some folks may not be familiar with your background and are probably interested to know how you came to making video essays. So what is the origin story and what got you interested in creating this kind of work? See, it's kind of a long, multifaceted story. But my background is actually in fine art rather than you know writing or filmmaking or the things other people generally seem to have backgrounds in. When I first made the decision to start making videos in the way that I'm making them, I'd never heard of video essays. I didn't know, I certainly didn't know how popular they were. And I feel like if I'd known that, I maybe wouldn't. I'd have like, oh, the world doesn't need another video essay, so I'll do something else. I'd been watching Lindsay Ellis's videos for a long time, but on her own channel like on her own website, so not on YouTube. And I'd seen one every frame of painting video randomly on Vimeo. And because it was on Vimeo, it didn't occur to me that there were more of them because I feel like on Vimeo, people make this one thing and then there's this one thing and they don't make other things. That's just been my Vimeo experience. So I didn't think to like click on the channel and be like, maybe there are other videos like this. So I started, at least started writing the essays, not knowing what video essays were, but knowing that there were at least two people online. (laughs) who talked about movies and then made it into a video. 
<laughs> that, that's so great. I love that origin story. And, and so to take that one step further, I'm wondering if you could tell me what is it that specifically prompted you to start making this kind of work on your own? It was my final year of university uh, and I was doing my dissertation and suddenly realized I wasn't going to have a reason to write essays anymore. And that suddenly felt sad. I was like, oh, I, I like writing essays. It's going to be sad to not write essays anymore. But I didn't think that I was going to enjoy writing enough to do it, not for an assignment or not like for a purpose, just to do it for myself. So then I was thinking, well, there are at least two people on the internet who make videos out of essays. Maybe I could do that. And I'd been really into video editing before and I used to make fan videos, but it wasn't something that I felt like I could justify now, probably because you can't make money out of it. And it, it feels like the only things that are worth doing are things you can monetize. Thanks, capitalism. So this, this seemed like a more justifiable use of video editing time. And I thought, well, I can combine video editing and essay writing, and maybe these are monetizable skills that I could use to get a job at some point. So really, I started making the videos as a kind of portfolio to hopefully get either editing or writing work. Uh, and I, I wrote four or five essays before making them into a video just to see if I was going to hate the writing process, because I thought I would. I was very surprised to find that, hey, actually, I do like writing, and that was why I wanted to do it. Who knew? That's so awesome that fan videos were kind of the precursor to your video essays. Uh, what kind of fan videos specifically were you making? Mostly with Disney films. Uh, I did do some with anime. Anime seems to be like AMVs, anime, anime music videos, were the, where all the cool kids were. And I made some with anime, but then mostly with Disney films. I had a, a foray into the X-Files at one point. <laughs> That was that was my fan video channel. It was Disney and the X Files. <laughs> That's so awesome. That sounds pretty great to me. And, and so, how does how does your background uh, making fan videos influence you as you work and create video essays today? Yeah, it's definitely influenced the style, uh, particularly my earlier videos. And still, I edit a lot of the clips to the music in the background. And and even if I'm editing to like the cadence of my own narration, it's a similar rhythm, rhythm based editing. And that's I'm I always have the most fun with editing if I'm editing to the music and I just turn I turn my voice off and I'm just gonna edit to what's happening in the background. And then it seems a shame to talk over it. And really I, I just wanna be making fan videos <laughs> is what I'm discovering in this moment. And particularly with my earlier videos, I used to like separate the foreground and the background a lot, especially if I was using uh, an animated film, because it's much easier to do that with animated films, which was something it was, was like my favorite thing to do in, in fan videos. I was always cutting things out and having them move independently from the background. I don't do that so much anymore. It takes a long time. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have time for that anymore, but I used to do that a lot. Speaking of things taking a lot of time, one of the things that I most admire about your video essays is how polished and precise the voiceover narration is. And when I imagine you making these video essays, I imagine you sitting down and writing out a, a and you've already described this a little bit, writing down and just writing out a full essay and then taking that essay and practicing the voiceover, you know, several times and tweaking words to make sure everything flows as you read it. And I'm wondering, you know, how, how do you get those incredibly polished voiceover narrations and, and and could you please take us could you please take us behind the scenes of your creative process I, I, am i correct in how i'm describing it yeah essentially how you're imagining it that i'd say my videos are in s probably an essay first and a video second whereas i know other people it's much more of a, an interconnected process um but i really i guess i write them i just i think it it means that sometimes there's a lot going on in my videos and maybe too much <laughs> frequently because I write them to be an essay and then I add the video on top of that and it's like oh there's a there's a lot going on here so it's like I, I treat every part of the process as its own thing so I want to make the essay to a certain standard as if it was just being read and then the voiceover to a certain standard as if it was just being heard and then the video <laughs> to a standard as if it was just being watched and then I put them all together and I think sometimes it's it's too much, but I can't stop myself. But generally, I don't necessarily know what's going to be on screen when I'm writing it. There are sometimes 
um, I've, I think I've, I'm writing this a certain way because I know there's this clip that I want to have them like interplay in a certain way. But mostly it's, if I find something that works while I'm editing, that's just luck. <laughs> I've had people come and be like, well, you must, you know, you must like do a lot of rough drafts and edits on these videos because you've matched clips so well to what you're saying. It's like, ah, it's just luck. <laughs> <laughs> and how long does that voiceover narration, just the constant rehearsal and trying to get it right, take? I mean, I'm someone who's inherently just scared of doing voiceover. Um, and it's not so much that I'm scared of my own voice, but just because I know that how labor is, how, you know, how labor intensive uh, such a process is. Well, I time track obsessively. <laughs> I'll just read them all. So speed was four hours, 40 minutes. The Marie Kondo one was four hours, 18 minutes. The Spirited Away one was five hours, 40 minutes. Firewatch was five and a half hours. Cam or Phantom, Phantom YouTube was four and a half hours. And the one I did for the BBC this year was one hour. So those are all, all my times diligently tracked. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that is just about as laborious as I expected. And, and you know, I, I think all of your voiceover, all of your video essays have voiceovers with them. Would you ever consider doing a video essay without voiceover? No. I, I'm not... <laughs> is, that, is that controversial? Hot take. Grace Lee would not consider making video essay without narration. <laughs> no, no, no. It, it's not that it's a hot take. It's just, I'm just surprised that you... Um, I guess are so committed to the voiceover narration style because you know your video essays are also you know so visually stimulating that I I could totally see you making one um, in the future that was just visuals. Um, but I guess this begs the question, you know, wh why? <laughs> the it's like it's the writing part that's it, I guess it's not most important, but it, it is like a very important part of the process for me. Um, and if if I was gonna do something without writing or without voiceover, I just, I wouldn't consider it a video essay anymore. I just consider it moving image work, which is probably a very fine art position. <laughs> it's a very fine art stance to take. Like, this is, this is moving image art. This isn't a video essay. Changing gears here for a minute. You operate primarily on YouTube and you have videos that have gotten, you know, tens of thousands of views. You have almost 50,000 subscribers. And I I'm wondering who, who is your audience? Who are you making video essays for? I'd say when I'm making them, my audience is me. <laughs> I don't really consider that there are other people in the world and not everyone's just a clone of myself. But that was, I, th I think increasingly I'm, I'm becoming more and more niche in what I'm making videos about. Maybe, I don't know. I'm getting more and more into just specifically what I'm interested in. <laughs> and I'll get like a load of, different examples of a thing that don't really connect in any way other than through me. And I'm like, I like all these things. So now we're going to talk about them. And I don't know how interesting that is for other people. This is like where we get into like Vimeo or like more, I'd say video essay as art as opposed to video essay as video <laughs> or as thing for broader consumption. For like YouTube, 50,000 subscribers is nothing. There are people with with millions of subscribers and so i i like to still think that i'm a small channel i feel like when i do reach fifty thousand subscribers i can't say that anymore and i'm gonna be sad it's great that people, i don't want people to think that, that don't don't unsubscribe i need my subscribers <laughs> but i do like thinking of myself as a small channel and that's it's about to be taken away from me. I totally get what you're saying about being a niche channel but at, at the same time you do have several videos that have you know neared or have surpassed, you know, 200,000 views. And, and again, you have 50,000 subscribers, which uh, I think a lot, there's a lot, a lot of people would love to have 50,000 subscribers. And, and so my question is, you know, you've had videos that have, uh, have gone viral and, and knowing that you are able to make videos that can reach that large an audience, does that, you know, you say you make video essays for you, but on some level that must, knowing you have that broad reach must in some way impact your creative process and how and how you approach topics is does the possibility of going viral enter your head at all in that way i don't know it doesn't oh it's when so like the video i did about marie kondo and 
objects and digital culture was is like the most viral I've ever gone and was a complete surprise because like it's it's not currently my most viewed video because that's the over the garden wall video but that happened like that video is nearly two years old now and that happened over a much longer period of time whereas the Marie, Con Marie Kondo video was like I think got like 200,000 views in three weeks which was insane. Of the three guests that I've had on this podcast you are the only one that operates primarily on YouTube. And my question is that we all kind of know that there are certain things that one should do to kind of uh, please the YouTube algorithm and to get your videos seen on YouTube. And uh, my question is, you know, what does YouTube want? What are the things that you're thinking about as you're making and publishing a video essay on YouTube? What YouTube wants is for people to stay on YouTube forever and never leave. So if, if you can make a two hour video that people are going to watch all the way through, that's, that's YouTube's favorite thing. So that's the one thing that you can do if you want to do well on YouTube, I guess. But outside of that, tags are apparently not important. The titles somewhat important, but mostly it's, it's the, th like, I guess thumbnail and title and then just how many people click on the video, but I don't know how to quantify that. No one knows how to quantify that. So YouTube seems to just randomly be like, oh, let's try this with this video. And then if people click on it, it'll show it to more people. I don't know. <laughs> I did a video for the BBC a few months ago and they're, they're really on the opposite train. And I think, I think the, originally the video I made for them was like eight minutes long. Uh, and then it ended up being cut down to like four minutes. So it was like cut in half. And they seem to be really on the opposite trend of thinking you need to keep things short otherwise people will stop watching but from what like from what every youtuber has said and from what i see in my analytics people will watch the same percentage of a video no matter how long it is it's like consistently every video i've made from the shortest one is like eight minutes i think or like or seven minutes my shortest one is seven minutes my longest one is 17 and a half minutes. Every video is like between 50 and 60% is the average view duration. People watch the same percentage of video no matter how long it is. I now like to transition to talking about your video essay, Feathered Foes, Birds in Horror. Could you give us the backstory on basically how this video essay came into fruition? <laughs> I, should have, I, I knew you were going to ask this and now I'm like, oh no, I'm not prepared. <laughs> I never really know why I decide to make any video like I know the steps leading up to it and it's it was like a six month well I what I think of as the incubation period of a video before I start properly working on it with like a six month period although I mean technically it could have you could consider it like a three-year period because it came from um Suki Best's moving image work which I talk about in the video it's like a couple of art films that use birds and I found I found her work from an art fair that I went to in 2015 I think and that she had a film showing there and I thought it was cool and I looked her up afterwards and then I found these bird films and I found an interview with her which I used in the video where she was talking about her interest in birds and how they were an animal that was both domestic and wild and that they're the only wild animals that we really like regularly come into contact with, especially in a city. And I'd never thought about birds in that way before. That they're just they're just always they're like wherever you are, there's always some kind of bird. There's birds in the sea, there's birds in the sky, there's birds waddling around, there's birds everywhere. It's a coup. <laughs> and I'd never thought about that before and that really stuck with me. And then I think in January or February of the year that I made the video the Anthropocene Reviews started, which is a podcast by John Green. And the first episode of that, they did um, a, like a mini essay on Canada geese and how Canada geese are everywhere and brought up this same sort of dichotomy of domestic and wild in relation to the Canada goose. And, it's, and I was like, oh, that's like what that artist that I like talked about ages ago. And at this point I was making video essays and it's, it sparked the idea of like, oh, I can make a video about that. And then from 
so from I think February maybe when I listened to that episode until the video was released in August, like that was just any any thought that I any film that I watched where a bird flew into a window, wrote that down, <laughs> and then any, any thoughts I had about birds just sort of got moulded in like a snowball until I felt like I had enough. They're like, I can do this video now. One of the things that I think makes your video essay so effective is the fact that you draw footage from a wide variety of films. On one end, you have clips from the most famous horror film to feature birds, and that's Alfred Hitchcock's The Birds. And then on the other, as you just mentioned, you have clips from the experimental films of Suki Best, which are not intended for you know a wide theatrical audience like a Hitchcock film. And, and so... To backtrack for a second, when I was an undergraduate at Middlebury, a classmate of mine did his senior thesis on the role of the supermarket in American films, and he made a series of video essays about the supermarket. And when we presented all of our senior work on a panel, the questions that he inevitably got were, you know, why didn't you include this film? Or did you consider doing this film? Or, you know, why not? did you not include the scene from Punch Drunk Love? And I think sometimes when video essays use a lot of footage from different films, it sort of invites the audience in to question why certain films weren't chosen. And also, perhaps if someone's personal favorite wasn't chosen, they feel almost like they need to personally chime in and defend the film that is their favorite. And I'm wondering if, if you've gotten that sort of feedback or those sort of comments on this essay. Um, I, I do get... I do get some comments like that. I wouldn't I wouldn't say a lot, but they definitely come up, particularly if I do a video like this where it's using clips from lots of different things. I, I mostly make, make my decision, as I've said, just on things that I like. It's I make I make no pretense at objectivity. <laughs> like these these are the things that I like and I'm gonna talk about them. So it's mostly just what whatever's my favourite things or the things that I personally find interesting to talk about. Occasionally I'll if there's something that's just like a really famous example, I'll use that. Like in uh, in this Birds video, I used a clip from Black Swan, which I haven't seen, <laughs> but I used the clip from it anyway, um, just because it's it's a very famous like horror horror ish film that includes bird imagery, and the there was, there was like a scene that I know from it, even though I haven't seen the film, that I thought that would be a good thing to portray whatever I don't remember what I was talking about whatever I was talking about at the time I thought this clip would like illustrate that really well so I included that more because it's a it's a, a film that I think a lot of people would have seen even though I myself haven't seen it in the trains video I use I, I definitely use a lot of films I hadn't seen in the trains video because there's there's a film at least one film from every decade in or like from every year in that video so sometimes I use famous examples I used Lord of the Rings I remember in a video once I can't remember why, but I was like, this is a film people will have seen. Again, I haven't seen it. It's not a horror film. It's not an experimental film, but I haven't seen it. But I know a lot of people will have, and then it's, it's a, then you don't have to explain what it is or what's happening because people know. But mostly it's just, it's whatever I like, <laughs> even if it's super obscure and no one else cares about it. <laughs> no, and, and I think that makes total and complete sense. And I think, you know, the personal attachment that you've, that, uh, you have to the films that you select comes through in your video essays. And I know that's part of the reason why I enjoy them is because it's so clear that you're a fan, which is why I was not at all surprised earlier that you said you began making online videos by way of uh, fan videoing. And I think, you know, if you were to just go with whatever you think people would want all the time, you would lose that that personal touch to your video essays that is uh, is so effective and I think really makes them so enjoyable to watch. And going off that, I'm wondering if, you know, there was one, going back to Feathered Foes, I'm wondering if there was one element in this video essay that was particularly challenging for you to do either formal, thematic. What was the most challenging aspect of making this video essay? I, th I feel like this might be my favorite video that I've ever made. I can't really pinpoint why. But one thing is like, I feel like I have a an affinity particularly with the videos where I first started trying something new and I think this was really the first video where I started trying to I mean in in my memory it was the first time I started trying to be humorous in videos when I watched it back in preparation for this episode 
It's super subtle. <laughs> I don't know if I can claim that any of this is humorous, but it's not entirely serious, which was the start of a shift that then progressed and I tried to include more and more, like a more or a more pers personalised kind of tone or a more humorous kind of tone in the videos. And it started with this video. I think when I had the idea to use a clip from Crazy Ex Girlfriend that I used at the start where she goes, ah, a bird! And because that was using something from comedy, it was, it, and it was in the introduction, it was like a way in to be like, I'm going to try and be funny again. <laughs> to, to little success, as I realise now. But it, it was the start of something. But that's probably the main thing that I struggle with or have consistently struggled with since that point is trying to introduce humour into the videos, which I want to do mostly because it is hard and it makes it, it's like, it's probably the most challenging thing that I find in writing is to, to either make things humorous, and I would say humorous rather than funny, <laughs> because I feel safer. I feel like I can claim things are humorous and people can't go, that's not funny. I'm like, I didn't say funny, I said humorous. <laughs> it counts. Uh, or to just make things entertaining is, I, I don't know if that's like the most challenging thing for, for any writer, but it's definitely the most challenging thing for me and therefore the most exciting thing to try and do with writing. I think that makes a lot of sense. And for the record, I, I do find your videos to be both very humorous and funny. I'm thinking specifically of a great meme joke that you made in your most recent video essay. Uh, but do you think that, that getting more comfortable with being humorous and, and, you know, making jokes, does that come with just time and, and do you feel yourself do you feel that you're more confident now than you were a couple years ago while making video essays it's certainly going to be part part just uh, an increased confidence like my one of my friends said about my most recent video essay that she thought this was like i was especially confident in this video it'll be this is like this was the watching the birds video again was the first time that i've gone back and watched one of my videos <laughs> i've always been too scared to do it i was like oh no and like if I if I hear someone else watching one of my videos when I'm I'm in the room I have to leave the room <laughs> like no I can't listen to my voice make it stop but I think it's it's probably actually a, a helpful exercise to go back and rewatch things so I think it's partly it's, it's partly confidence and I've become more con like I I used to put things things that were humorous in earlier videos and I cut them out often because my delivery always came up short of what I'd written. And so I could, I could say it funny in my head, but then when I tried to say it out loud, I was like, what are you doing? Why does it sound like that? <laughs> and then I think it's, it's like wanting to do something new or like to try and push things further. And so I've, I picked the thing that I found most difficult and I, I don't want to push it too far, especially as it's something maybe I'll get more comfortable with it but at least at the moment it's not something that I'm particularly comfortable doing it's definitely out of my comfort zone and I don't think it's it's something that I'm naturally good at so I don't want to like decrease the quality of the video or like waste people's time because sometimes people will dedicate like a good 30 seconds to a joke that doesn't really add to the video and then if it's not funny I'm like that was not funny enough to justify 30 seconds of my time and I don't want to get into that situation because I'm not very good at the jokes. But if I can, I, I tend to try and do it where if I can make my point through a joke and the, a jokey way of presenting something is the fastest, most effective method of communicating something, that tends to be where I focus my energy. And if I could just use a meme, it's like I can just take credit for someone else's work. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And and to completely change subjects here, I, I was just reminded that one thing that I meant to ask you earlier was, there's a video on your YouTube channel uh, called The Inevitable Patreon Announcement. And I, you know, for folks who are listening to this podcast who perhaps are making video essays of their own or are just kind of looking for tips on how to navigate the that world, um, Patreon is you know, a service that many video essayists use as a form of income and to cover costs for making video essays. And and I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about your decision to use Patreon account and and maybe for folks who are wondering, when should I start a Patreon account of my own? You know, is it the right avenue to take? What are some just general tips for, you know, when the best time to do that is? Yeah, I think originally, well, firstly, people started asking me 
if I had a Patreon, if I was going to make one and asking me to make one when I said I didn't have one. So that was like the first indication. That, hey, maybe I, should, maybe I should make a Patreon. So I told myself, yeah, I told myself if I reached 10,000 subscribers, I'd make a Patreon. And then I reached 10,000 subscribers and I still didn't feel comfortable making a Patreon. So I, I think it was, I'd maybe reached 15,000 subscribers. It was like a few months after I actually reached 10,000 that I thought... I sh it, it was more my own insecurities that were holding me back from doing it. And I thought, I'm just, I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do it. It's going to be fine. So I think now a lot of people, I, maybe it's because I didn't intend the video essays to be their own thing when I started. It was just meant to be a portfolio that I could send to people and be like, hey, let me edit videos for you or write, write things for your publication, whatever I was going for. Uh, but I think a lot of people now... So they start a Patreon as soon as they start their channel and they've got one video and they're like, support me on Patreon, which I always think is a bit intense. But that's, I don't think there's anything wrong with just starting when, like, just start when, start it when you start your channel. It's fine. <laughs> Pe people will support you, which is a constant delight and surprise to me <laughs> that anyone supports what I do. Um, th there isn't really a, a good time to do it. I was just insecure about I think one introducing a financial element to something I was doing for fun, which is always a contaminating force. And I think it it makes me like it hasn't really affected what I do or how I do them, apart from maybe allowing me to feel like I can spend longer on the videos, which is a a good and bad thing depending on how you look at it. Now that I release a video like every two months, it's just getting. Longer and longer between them as I spend more and more time on them, but I don't think it's really affected what I'm what I'm doing in the videos. But it does affect. It's like it's not a hobby anymore. It's a thing that I do for money, and you know, combining the Patreon and AdSense money, it's like a decent amount of money. Not, I mean, it's not minimum wage for the hours that I put into it, but it's it feels like a decent amount, like percentage of income now and it's so it, it was a thing that was just mine that felt like it isn't just mine anymore and I think it's always important to have things that are just yours and aren't for public consumption so that's that's always something to consider when you start a Patreon but it's vastly outweighed by being able to have a regular consistent income for something and while um, I have a job uh, like a freelance job right now that I really like and I'll do for as long as they'll hire me to do things for them. And I like having something that's outside of myself and doing something for other people and kind of working behind the scenes. I think when that inevitably ends, I might try and just like not necessarily apply for jobs and potentially wait for something to come to me if something cool comes along that I want to do, but just try and make, make, a, make a thing of the Patreon and of my own channel. And I wouldn't say do video essays full time because I don't do anything full time. I'm too fractured of a person to have a career. I have like three different careers and I want to do them all. And I've got so many plates spinning and it's a lot, but I just, I want to, I want to do all the things. And I think that's maybe partly being in my mid twenties and feeling like there's there's still a lot of life. You know, if we go on the natural human lifespan, there's still a lot of life left there. <laughs> and I don't want to close any doors. So any door that I open, I'm just like propping it open with a stick as I try and keep all these other doors also open and just not let any of the doors close. Who knows what I'm going to want to do in the future. But to maybe make video essays my primary source of income in the future. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> I'd now like to transition to talking about the video essay that you selected for us to talk about, and that is Kevin B. Lee and Chloe galbert Linnae's Reading, Binging, Benning. And my first question is pretty simple, and that is, why did you choose this video essay? Why do you find it so compelling? I particularly liked that it was so collaborative. And I've, I've, never, I've not seen another video that's as collaborative as this one is. And like, I can't, I wouldn't be able to separate out who who did what and that's i think that's true of any collaborative video essay but it often feel it often feels like you can separate out who does what even if you're probably wrong 
Um, actually, I I mentioned a video that came out like yesterday on H Bomber Guy's channel about um, director's cuts, and that was a collaborative video between him and um, Shannon Strucci. And then I saw her tweet um, later on saying people were assuming that he wrote it and she edited it because that's what you see in the video. Um, and they do sort of bits to camera between themselves where she's editing stuff in real time and like cutting things out and you see it in the video. And so people had like delineated their roles down what they saw when actually they both wrote it, they both edited it. So people, people will always try and like I do with Vimeo and YouTube, segment things out. It feels more comfortable. Uh, but with this, like you can't even try and create that kind of narrative because they're, they're both talking. It feels like a conversation. It's not clear whose screen you're looking at at, at any one point. So it's, it feels like just a conversation, even though it's obviously, I'd say obviously scripted. I think it's obviously scripted. I actually don't know, but I'm going to say that as if it's fact, because I'm fairly sure it's obviously scripted. So it was, I, I've not seen anything done in that, in that collaborative vein. And also that it's, I mean, this is, it's because it's in the desktop documentary genre, which I'm not super familiar with. People listening are probably more familiar with this than I am. I'm going to sound like a chump because I don't know what I'm talking about. But I think it's a because it's a feature of that whole genre where you're doing, or at least at certain points, appear to be doing things in real time, which is something that I find anxiety-inducing. <laughs> that it's it's like I, at any point I'm expecting the internet connection to break down or for things to start buffering or to accidentally close down the tab that you need and then have to navigate back to it. I'm const I'm waiting for the mistakes to happen. Even, even when the it's like listening to a live performance kind of induces the same reaction in me where I always feel like something's about to go wrong. And I was waiting for, <laughs> even though I, I knew it wasn't going to happen because it's not actually, in, it's not actually in real time. The monkey brain again, telling me bad things are going to happen. I totally agree. And I, I think there's a really brilliant way that this video essay and the desktop documentary genre in particular really just deconstructs digital culture by way of the the desktop and the computer screen. Because I think, you know, if there's one thing that I most associate with my own desktop, it's control. It's the fact that I can manipulate it to do whatever I want. If I'm working on something at any point, I can go and, you know, distract my mind on Twitter or go look at a YouTube video or watch a video essay or, or, or do whatever. And by taking away that control, it really makes us play witness to what's going on on the desktop screen. And it really, as you alluded to, removes any sense of comfort that we associate with our desktop. I know for me, the side of my desktop sitting on my computer is probably one of the greatest sources of comfort in my life. Um, and I think that's just indicative of you know, being creatures of the internet and doing so much online. And I think in removing that comfort, removing that sense of control, it really forces us to reflect on how we consume media, how we consume video, and as this video essay is doing, how we consume cinema in the digital age. Yeah, there's a line in a, in a podcast that I heard recently that was talking about like real-time conversation that said things were happening at the speed of life and it was making me nauseous. <laughs> And that's how I feel. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that totally uh, encapsulates the sentiment of the video essay. And going back to one other thing that you mentioned about whether the video essay is scripted or not scripted, I, I agree that I think it is scripted. Uh, if it is not, apologies to Kevin and Chloe. Please let us know if, if we've got that wrong. But I, I, I think it's definitely scripted, but there is an authenticity that you've touched upon that I think still exists, even though it is scripted, because it feels as though this is a conversation that Chloe and Kevin had independently of this video. And then we're like, oh, let's recreate elements of this for the video essay. And I think that's an incredibly effective tool that they use in crafting this piece. And I'm wondering if there is one formal choice that Kevin and Chloe make in this video essay that you find particularly compelling. I have I have one moment in mind, and that is when Kevin goes and downloads all of the James Benning films 
that are available on YouTube that he can find, and he places them into iMovie. And then what he does is he isolates the portion of iMovie that allows you to edit clips. And with all of the James Benning clips sort of stacked, he he moves them uh, from right to left and in this sort of scrolling motion. And then there is a match cut. And then we see footage from one of James Benning's films in which a train is passing by. And and this moment does a couple of things. First, it, it, it mimics the poetry of cinema. But what it also does is it sets up a central contrast of the video essay. And that is that this video essay, yes, it's about the films of James Benning. But what it really is about is about digital culture and about consumption and and the way that we interact with the Internet and online video and how it, it really changes the way that we as individuals interact with cinema, which I think is one of the strengths of the desktop documentary genre in general, and that it gets us to think about how we interact with things. And this beautiful contrast really goes to show how the films of James Benning, which are really the antithesis of of digital culture and internet culture, uh, are be, are being used by Kevin and Chloe to to examine it, to to understand how we watch and interact with things online. And, and I'm wondering if there's you know, a formal choice or a moment that, that, that particularly resonated with you. I think that's, that's not really the kind of thing that I tend to think about. Like I hadn't really thought about what you just said about the match cut of the scrolling timeline with the train. Um, so I'm, I, think I, I, I think in words too much <laughs> to, to notice those things unless... Unless that's all that's happening. Like if it was just the video, I'd see stuff like that because I'm not thinking about what's being said and what's being talked about. So when I think of the formal elements, it's more in terms of how the conversation came together and playing on the kind of fiction of constructing a conversation in that way. Which is why I still have like a like a tiny bit of doubt that I can't shake about it being scripted, even though it must like it must have been scripted. <laughs> but I like but there's like there's bits where they're where they're laughing as they say things, and it's like some sometimes it sounds very natural, and then like there's that little bit of doubt introduced into my mind about whether this is real or not, and to what extent you can think of something as real. And in and then like that kind of comes into the video at the end in terms of people remaking their own kind of Benning films and then the whole conversation about what did it mean to experience something. So I'm just I'm purely focused on that <laughs> and I've gone off on my own tangent. <laughs> no, no, no. I don't think it's a tangent at all. And and, and in fact that sort of relates to my next question is I, I noticed a lot of the themes that Kevin and Chloe touch upon are also themes that you touch upon in your own work. And I'm thinking specifically your most recent video essay, which also borrows some techniques from desktop documentary. And and I'm wondering if this video essay in particular has influenced your own work at all. Yeah, I don't think I think it's more just that digital culture is potentially the thing I am most interested in and that was why I was drawn to this video and also why I'm exploring it in my own videos. I think I use desktop documentary style things more in an illustrative fashion rather than as a stylistic choice which is slightly different and also because in the most recent video I was desperate to find things (laughs) to show on the screen because I had no like original film footage to go off of. Um, other than 24 Hour Psycho, I don't, I mean, I guess the YouTube videos I talked about, I don't, there wasn't really anything I was talking about that was video based. Uh, so there's usually, there's usually something, <laughs> even in my broader videos, there's something that's a film that I can use. Um, so I ended up using a lot of archive footage, um, using some stock footage and then making things myself. So anything where I could feasibly record my own screen to illustrate something that was what I chose to do. And I think it's, uh, it particularly lends itself to talking about social media. You mentioned the idea of using screen capture to illustrate something. And one of the, the, the moments in this documentary that really stuck in my head and is very illustrative is when Kevin goes and uh, is talking about meeting Benning and actually pulls up a picture of the bar that he had a conversation with him in. And 
for some reason, that moment really stuck with me, and I'm not entirely sure why. I think it's because it, it seems so unnecessary in a way, but it's an interesting commentary on digital culture and that here Kevin is with this memory, and he's able to just go online, search for this bar, and find an image of exactly where that memory happened. And therefore, because that image exists, it almost needs to be conjured up in that way for the video essay when Kevin is mentioning it. I don't really have a question for that, but I just think it's super interesting. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are on, you know, this idea of of representing images. A lot of, you know, interior meaning, as I think that moment does. And on the surface, it's just about Kevin showing us where he met James Benning. But really, it is about the immediacy of the image on the Internet. Yeah, I definitely think meaning is more than than what was intended. And you can even if. Um, you know, they weren't thinking about the like the afterlife of memories that exists online now, or like this kind of alter ego of memories that you can find, and that we don't even think about finding. Like that, he just searches it and pulls it up, and it doesn't. You don't think, oh, it's weird that I can go and find a picture of this bar that I was at, and it doesn't matter that I didn't take a picture of it. It's just a thing that you naturally do be like, of course I can do that. It's the internet. I can do anything. I'm God now. Even if that wasn't intentional, I think that meaning is still relevant and still definitely an interesting thing to talk about. And I find that when I'm making my own videos, I think particularly because as I talked about before, when I'm editing, all that there is is the image. And so I will focus on that. I think it's like, when sometimes I see people or hear people who were shocked to find out that films will assign meaning to costume and colours. It's like, you know, there's someone that's their whole job is to do the colours or is to do the costumes. The whole job is to design like the soundscape. They're going to put effort into it. (laughs) This is the only thing they're focusing on. And because like the only thing I'm focusing on in editing is the image that I'll find like, oh, like, oh, I could put this image next to this image or I can pair this image with what I'm talking about and create new meanings that I didn't think about when I was originally writing it. But because now I'm only focusing on this other thing, I can think about that more deeply and allow other associations to come in and build their own meanings. And um, that's always fun to do. And I, I imagine happens to a lot of people. I think, I don't know. I, I'm assuming again, I was again, I'm assuming my experience is universal, <laughs> but in the face of no contrasting evidence, I'm going to say it as fact. <laughs> and I think on that note is a great way to end our conversation. Grace, thank you so much for taking the time. It was so great talking to you. Yeah, I, I really appreciate you inviting me to be on a podcast. I've never been on a podcast before. I'm so excited. <laughs> I love, I love podcasts so much. <laughs> Thank you again to Grace Lee for agreeing to be a guest on the show. Grace, thank you so much for taking the time. I really, really appreciate it. And if you haven't already, please be sure to go check out Grace's YouTube channel, What's So Great About That? My next guest will be Jacob Swinney, who many of you will know from his days creating video essays at Fandor and for just being one of the most prolific video essay makers online today. He is also the creator of the popular Twitter account, First and Final Frames. Jacob is a filmmaker and a fixture of the online film world today. We will be going in depth on his video essay, First and Final Frames, which has been viewed more than 2.4 million times on Vimeo. And we will also be diving deep into the video essay, The Art of Overanalyzing Movies, which is published by Now You See It on YouTube and was selected by Jacob as one of his best video essays of the year in the Sight and Sound poll. That episode will be coming out on Thursday, September 19th, two weeks from today. So be sure to be on the lookout for that. I also ask that you please consider subscribing to us on iTunes and or Spotify and leaving a five-star review. You can access your homework for next week's show at thevideoessay.com and by following us on Twitter at VideoEssayPod and on Facebook, The Video Essay Podcast. Again, be sure to do your homework before next week's show and you can access it all at thevideoessay.com. Thank you so much and peace out.